please give a warm welcome to writer and director George Tillman, Jr. So glad to be, to have you back, George. Thank you for having me. Yeah, um, yep. I, I've been a big fan of your movies, starting with Soul Food. We were talking about Soul Food earlier. And what, it was, what has struck me about watching this film is that themes, there are themes that recur through all your films, family, um, you know, faith. But faith, you, there, there's always been spirituality in your film, but it's sort of been in the, on the back burner. In this film, spirituality, faith, is in the forefront. You know, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I felt really good to do that finally in a film because, you know, I come from, you know, I used to, my family used to go to church every Sunday. I was forced to go every Sunday, right? Um, and the spirituality is in me, but I always feel like sometimes films that embrace that, sometimes they go a little too far. That's just my personal take. When you're dealing with spirituality, sometimes they get a little preachy. So the great thing about this film the character is a preacher. He is a minister. He gives up boxing. So it becomes part of his DNA And when he's trying to find his truth. So I found the perfect story to sort of bring back some of the things that I learned as a kid with my family and my, my grandmother on soul food. All those Sunday dinners and soul food was after church. So that's sort of sort of the DNA of me as a filmmaker and as a person. Um, I don't think I've seen a scene quite like the, the Jesus is coming alive in me scene halfway through the movie. Um, you know, can you tell us about uh, writing that scene and actually directing it as well? Yeah, that was a tough one because when we did the film, that's the one thing George Foreman was really adamant about is that we get that scene right. It's been a lot of things that was said about why he stopped boxing and what happened that night with Jimmy Young in Puerto Rico. Some people said he had a heat stroke. Some people said he was, you know, he was just punch drunk. But George said he died and he came back. And he said he, when he died, he went to black. He felt like he was in a black hole. And he said he started smelling death. He started smelling something. And he said when he felt he was in a black hole, he said, I believe... I believe, and it, he came back. That's what he told me. So in my head, is, as a filmmaker, how do I visualize that to an audience where it feels very reality-based and very truth? So I sort of stated his POV when he went to black. I just went out. I, did, I just stayed very simple, and I really wanted to get what George really wanted to get across. That was very important to him. And the second thing that was important to him was his mother, that relationship with his mother. He said, my mom never went to a fight. She never liked that I was a fighter. And that's one of the two things that I had to get right in the movie. But that was a very pivotal scene. And I felt like if I didn't get that right, you wouldn't believe the rest of the film at that point. Um for the, you all have seen the movie now. To me, when I was watching, when the first time I watched it, I felt you made two movies here. Um, the first half of the movie has this all complete different DNA, um, visual style, and then ha then the second half shifts dramatically, visually, uh, color palette changes, et cetera, et cetera. Take, you know, walk us through that change. Yeah, that was a feeling I was, when I was talking to George about his life, the first half of his life, he described how angry he was, how, how people just overlooked him and wrote him off. In the second half of the movie, he's a person who's on a mission. I always felt that objective is still the same, is trying to be a good guy, trying to be a good person, trying to leave a stamp in where he is. First is being a boxer, the second part is about being a minister, being the best that he can be. And he'd make mistakes in both of them. But when he described it, it's like almost when you get a new spiritual awakening, you see things differently. The way you approach people, the way you talk, even Chris, the actor who plays George Foreman, his body behavior is sort of different, his, the way he looks. So I took that approach. I didn't go as extreme as, of course, I don't, I don't want to, you know, Stanley Kubrick's one of the greatest filmmakers ever. But if you see his film, Full Metal Jacket, it's two movies, right? It's completely different. I knew I couldn't go that far because the studio would kill me, but I felt like I wanted to have a different progression, and I didn't want to feel like I was just making another 
boxing movie. So my approach is to follow the character, stay in his point of view, and let us switch and change as he's changing. When he's confused, he, we are confused. So that was my, um, that was my approach to the filmmaking. Um, speaking of being confused, um, we, you and I briefly talked before, uh, right now, we talked about halfway through the movie that there is this, you, the, the narrative shifts. Um, and there is this period of confusion where we don't know where the narrative is going and take us. Can you uh, walk us through that? Yeah, that was a very, uh, that was George was feeling in his real life. He described it too. When he sort of embraced spirituality, he would sort of walk and go to a mall and he would see some of his old friends and they would see him and they would run away from him because they knew he would talk about spirituality. He was wondering if all the things that I was feeling, is it right? Do I know how to be a minister? All he knew was how to use his fists. So I wanted the audience to feel that sense of moment. He's unbalanced in his life. You know, he's a guy who don't know quite what to do, who to trust. Am I making the right decisions? So I wanted the audience to feel that way. But I didn't want to be that long where your narrative, because the narrative's moving at such a fast pace the first half of the movie, and it suddenly slows down. Mm -hmm. And I think what, it, and the reason why is something is out of his life, which is boxing, which was always, let me get to Ali. That was always the thing. Let me get my belt back. Let me become the Olympics champs. When you take that all the way, when you start in a new life, your spirituality is all about yourself and how can you become better. So I wanted to experience that. The key of it was finding the pace for the movie where I don't stay too long, mm. where people start walking out. So that was something that I really wanted to uh, really accomplish in the film. Mm -hmm. um, your boxing sequences, the, the camera is so close and we actually feel the punch going into the body, and those are the actors doing it. Can you tell us about that choice, the fact that we see the fist close to to the bodies? Yeah, I always watch, when I watch boxing movies, and I don't know if you guys feel that way, even though how you are caught up in the drama and you're following the story, when you watch a, a person swing, you can see the space, right? It's almost a stunt boxing. And I was never like, I, I just felt like I didn't want to do that on this film. I wanted to be as real as possible. Sp reason why is because some of the three most historical boxing fights is in the movie, which is Joe Frazier, George Foreman, Joe Frazier, and Frazier, also For Foreman versus Ali, mm -hmm. and Michael Moore. Those three boxing matches are all on YouTube. We see it when I was a kid, ABC Sports, used to rebroadcast them, ESPN broadcast them. I had to get it right and specific, so we follow everything to a T. So in terms of the stunt boxing, I didn't want to do stunt boxing. I wanted those guys to hit and fight each other for real. So the key of that is to get the, all the other opponents were real boxers. Our only two actors were Ali, played by Sullivan Jones, and Chris Davis. Those guys takes, takes punches as well. And it's all about just being real. And the key to that, when we got to the close-ups, we call that specials. So we'll do all the punches in the body. They know how to take those punches. When it's time for the face, we'll give the look, okay, guys, it's time for the specials. And then we go to the close-ups of the hitting of the face. So when you see Ali in round eight, when he hits the three-punch combination on our actor, we did that 42 times. So he took 42 punches to the face. So we did that in a safe way, way, nobody got hurt. But that's the key, because I knew I was dealing with real fights. Um, so that's, that's, that was my approach to the fighting. Well, what about also the, the, the having, listening to what you just said, the cardio training for the actors, because they're, they're repeating the sequence over and over and over again. Did they have to also build up their cardio to be able to do? Yeah, that was one of the, the first cinematographers that I talked to. Um, he's award-winning cinematographer. I really wanted to work with him. That's the first thing he said. It was very, it was very uh, tough for me. He was like, there's no way you're going to get your boxers to repeat two minutes of each round. They're going to be dead in like four maybe five rounds, four or five hours, you won't be able to finish the whole fight. It's not going to happen. 
And I just felt like, I don't know if I believe that. So the cardio buildup was part of the process. Something happened to me when I was making Men of Honor uh, with Robert De Niro, Cuba Gooding Jr. Michael Mann wanted to meet Cuba Gooding Jr. for that movie. So I said, yes, you can see my movie if you let me sit down with you and pick your brain. So I came over to his office, and I saw how he was designing and preparing Will Smith for Ali. So I, that was in my head for years. So 18 years later, when I was making a movie, that was part of my design to get the actor ready. Chris Davis never knew how to box before this movie. So first, we learned him how to box. Part of that program was building the cardio, building George Foreman body in the first half of the movie, and learning the choreography. And then being able to build the cardio to go a full two minutes each round. So we had a whole year of preparation to, to do that. So that was part of the process. So, so I understand. He learned the choreography for all the fights, even after he's gained all the weight, but he hasn't gained the weight. Is that correct? So he learned. Yeah. I so how do we did the film was we shot the film in two blocks, which means that we shot all the young George Foreman up to, the, to his spiritual awakening, and then we stopped. And then I went away for six, seven weeks, and my actor, Chris Davis, went to town eating. <laughs> for six weeks, cardio every day. And when I saw him in six weeks, I didn't want to bother him, put the pressure on him. We got a New Orleans coach from the New Orleans Saints to watch his cardio, watch his weight. When I saw him, he picked up 50 pounds. Mm. And he cut the hair and he had the belly. And then we shot the second half of the movie for another five weeks. So that's how we did it in two parts. So the actor is allowed to pick up the weight for us. Why did, were you determined to have one actor carry you through the entire movie as opposed to having you know, multiple actors, you know, the younger and then the older George? I felt that um, it would have been enough. I knew I had, to, I had had a little kid to play young George. I just felt for an audience to take in three different actors would be tough. I felt like I really wanted the audience to really connect with that one actor, his behavior, his agenda, his wants, to fall in love with this one person and be able to make that a continuous all the way through. That was my plan. That was breaking down during the rehearsals, during the auditions, because I couldn't find, for four weeks, I couldn't find the right George. And then one day, Chris Davis came in and did, we did our auditions on Zoom. This was my first time doing auditions on Zoom. And he was an actor on Broadway. Um, he played Jack Johnson at the Lincoln Center. So I knew he, he had the range as an actor. And then when I finally got a chance to see him, he was 6'4". And I knew at 6'4", his body could take the weight and he could take the young George. And that's when I knew I had my right George at that point. There's one scene that, that I'll never, it, it just it, it stuck with me. The one where he's in school and he raises his hand and he's overlooked. Um, you know, can you tell us about writing the scene and the importance of having that scene in the movie? Yeah, that was the scene that, that was the first conversation when I met George in Houston. And he talked about that moment um, as a young kid being overlooked. There was two things in his life um, that really stuck with him as a young boy. One was that moment there when he was overlooked because of the clothes that he wore. The other moment was he said there was always a family member who always looked at him and said, you know, I don't understand why you continue to want to learn. Nobody in this family is going to be anything anyway. And that moment in the teacher moment connected with him. And I think that was the moment of his drive. And I knew, I understood that moment, you know, just being a young African-American director and being a young African-American man, come boy, living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I grew up, there's this movie uh, called Cooley High, mm -hmm. directed by Michael Schultz, and then just watching Lucas, American Graffiti. I wanted to make movies. And a lot of my friends, and I was like 12, 13 years old, 
I want to be a filmmaker. Nobody in Milwaukee become a filmmaker. And they didn't know that the director of Cooley High was a, uh, was a director from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh -huh. So I understood that when you judge a book by its cover, and I think that's what drove George all the way through, and I had to put that in the movie. Um, you know, tell us about working with George uh, Foreman and his involvement in the film. George was great. I think a lot of the people in the, in the studio were afraid of him, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because he had his way of how he saw the movie. Um, and that first beginning, when I got involved, we wrote a script, and it was, uh, we, we gave him the script, and he said, I like the script. He said, I cried when you, that moment when my mom says, you got more inside you than you think you know. And then I was like, great. And then we got a green light, and then George says, hey, I had a problem with the script. I was like, wait, 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 you said you liked the script. And he's like, well, there's just some things that was missing in there. And I said, let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Let's talk more. And we went eight months back in to go deeper into his life and what he felt about Ali. And there was a lot of misconceptions. He says, I only saw Ali in Africa one time. I said, but in all the documentaries and you guys at a press conference, he's like, we never seen each other. And he said, I brought a dog to Africa. Everybody said, everybody was afraid of my German Shepherd. But Nobody had a problem with my German Shepherd. My German Shepherd. I got out of the plane in in, uh, in Africa, and people was there to greet me. There were so many misconceptions about him, and I think these are some of the things that he allowed me to put in the movie, and he allowed me to put in some of his flaws, which was very important. So he was open to have all that in the film. You had him on on set. And the great thing, uh, well, not a great thing, but he only came one time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reason I say a great thing is this gets, it's, it's tough. I never, I made a film about other people and they passed away. But having somebody alive, it just makes it tougher. So he came on the set when we were shooting the Joe Frazier versus Foreman scene. And he stayed for about two hours and he left. He trusted us to, to tell his movie, um, his life story. And he was available whenever I need him. And that was something I thought was a resource. And what was his reaction to, to seeing the film? Um, the first time he saw it was in Houston. And uh, I was surprised. Sony showed it to him uh, with his family there, all his family. And he showed it with an audience. I just really wanted him to be in the movie theater. And I was going to be there. So when it comes up, I could say, George, there's a few things. Let me explain. <laughs> I did this because of this. <laughs> I wasn't there, and I didn't. And then I heard that he loved the movie, and he said he wants to see it over and over. Um, so I was really happy about that. Um, you know, tell us about working with a great Forrest Whitaker. Forrest was amazing. Um, I just want to start off by saying, when we were making the movie, there was a lot of obstacles. First of all, for everyone, COVID shut us down. We couldn't even start. We got the green light. So 2020, we had to just sit for a whole year and wait, but we used that time. Chris used that time to get his stuff ready, how to box, how to do all these things. But as soon as we got ready to go in 2021, in New Orleans, there was a hurricane. And then it blew off the, the top of our building. So when that happened, I went back to LA and I was waiting and then we got the news that the original actor who's supposed to have played Doc Brodus was Michael K. Williams from The Wire. And then I got the news that he passed away. And then I was like, oh man, this movie is just, I was, it was a really tough time because Michael K. Williams was really determined to play the role. And he felt his spiritual awakening was part of his story. So I thought we were done until I heard uh, Forrest Whitaker read the script. And he said he loved, the, he loved the story. He wants to get involved with it. I knew Forrest from just in Los Angeles as a mentor, as a friend, one of my favorite actors. I love when he played Charlie, Bur Charlie Parker and Bird, Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. Yeah, amazing performance. So he got involved, and it was an amazing process because working with an actor who's a director is very supportive. They don't get in the way. They understand the process. Um, I was concerned because a lot of his parts as well in the boxing is just standing around in the corner. 
and he has some great moments and great performances, but when we shoot the scenes, he's there in the corner a lot. And he was like, don't worry, I'm here, I'm here to support, and I just love this story. Um, the way he takes the simplicity of the character of a, of a guy named Doc Brodus, who's a man who was a boxer but had to let it all go and finds his, his arc and just being there. And one of the key things that he told me by looking at Doc Brodus was he was just, he said the key to that act, to that character, is in a documentary when Doc says all George Foreman was, wanted was somebody to take an interest in him. And that was his way into the character, and that was what George really wanted, and that's what that relationship was about. Um, the actor that plays uh, Ali, Sullivan Jones, had played Ali before in One Night in Miami. Um, tell us about working with him and, and the, you know, what he brought to the table, having played Ali before. Yeah, that was amazing, because when I got his audition tape, he had James Brown music over the over. He put it in a, a visual three-minute clip had James Brown music, him doing Ali, him doing the dance, him doing the rope, him doing the punches. He was ready, right? He was awesome. He knew one of Ali's daughters. He had that relationship. So I said, I want to get them in a room together. We did a chemistry test with those guys in Los Angeles. The chemistry was there. And then when we start digging deep, we started realizing, wow, I says, we're ready for the go. We're ready to go. But then we start realizing that we were playing Ali in 1972 and 71. Around 74, Ali was deteriorating at that point. He couldn't move as fast. His, his body language was slower. His, his behavior was less. So that's some of the adjustments that we made. And having an actor who's very fast, very quick, and Chris is very thought, pr thought process. And these guys are two different kind of way how they work. But it really worked for the roles. And he's a, he's a really great actor. Indulge me with a super nerdy question, but I was noticing the bout with Ali, the knockdown. You do a three-angle coverage. You know, tell us about um, you know shooting that that sequence and that moment in particular. Yeah, a lot of that was just um, always felt like with boxing. I try to stay in the ring as much as possible, being a subjective point of view with these guys. So one of the things I felt that we had was 1970 boxing. Now, how can this movie be different? In 1970s, when they fought, it was a lot of outdoor boxing, smaller places like the Hilton or Caesars, these little small rooms or these big, large places. So you have these big highlight, these big lights where a lot of flares are coming in. So part of me was just want the audience to experience what it's like to be in these moments. And that was my choice of really sort of being there. In the three-punch knockdown, um, I shot that from George's sort of point of view and sort of two over-the-shoulder shots and then being able to slow the material down so they can be able to feel that George's path is sort of falling away. All the things that he was aiming to achieve in his life is going to go. It's going to go in a new direction. So that was my choice of, from a visual aesthetic standpoint is let us experience what it's like to really be in that moment in the 70s. Um, the biggest takeaway from your film super inspirational, the the total embracing of change. I mean, he undergoes so much. I mean, he changes his personality. He changes his life. He changes the way he boxes. Um, he changes his per perspective of life from being a completely selfish human being to understanding that he needs to be selfless. You know, tell us about managing all those 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 changes. Yeah, a lot of that is, you know, one of the things I learned is the relationship with the actor is always the most important. Um, you know, like that conversation, you know, when I was working with Robert De Niro, he was telling me his relationship with Scorsese. I was surprised that uh, he gave Scorsese the book Raging Bull, and that was that relationship, be really a partnership. So I try to have that partnership with all my with my actors, especially my main protagonist in the story. So a lot of that is really just me just constantly talking about the material with my actor, where we are in these moments. What is the major theme? It's hard for me to really approach a movie unless I say, what am I trying to say in the inside first? What is the point? And then within those points, what is each scene helping this thematic moment? And how is it getting away by taking things away and adding things? 
So that ideal of George using his fists and his anger and then losing that, but the key of that is it sort of is there, but it's always br brewing. And that's something I felt with George Foreman. Like, any, like, George always felt like once that happened, I changed. I'm different. And I was like, no, the movie is over. And I can always sense is you always struggling to go back to who you were. That's why we see the moment with Desmond when he steals his money and George almost goes to that point. And I think that's probably why the studio as well was like, hey, let's handle George and let's make sure everything's okay. So how to balance these layers, how to make sure those are all there. And I think that's part of the filmmaker job with the actor and the screenwriter to make sure that stays and this feels very consistent. Well, thank you so much, George, for being here. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank Amazing you. film. And everybody, please spread the word. The movie opens. April 28th, next Friday. It thank opens you. wide. So please spread the word. Thank you.